much. We're going to begin with uh, the prayer uh, for Ukraine, and there, you'll notice there's a candle and, the, and a lighter on your, and I invite each uh, person to, uh, a person from each table to, to light the candle now. <coughs> May the candle be a symbol not only of uh, your individual prayer, but also of our common prayer for the resolution of the war between Ukraine and Russia for resolution and renunciation of the use of armed forces in the region, for serious negotiations, not only in the hope of resolving the war, but also toward a lasting peace. May the light of our candles burning in the darkness remind us of the light of Christ's love and the power of love to illuminate even the darkest the deepest darkness of hatred and mistrust and fear and evil. May we believe this light, take comfort from this light, strengthen this light. So I invite you just now to sit uh, comfortably in your chair, sit quietly for a few moments as we seek to breathe together uh, for peace. Breathe slowly, quietly, quietly calming ourselves. Take a breath. Breathe out anxiety. Breathe in peace. Breathe out fear. Breathe in trust. Breathe out resentment. Breathe in joy. Breathe out hate. Breathe in love. Breathe out worry. Breathe in the calmness of God's presence and become fully present to this moment, this time of prayer, this light of Christ, the risen one who dwells within each of us. God of faithfulness, we come to you troubled by the war in Ukraine. We are filled with anxieties and questions. What change are we able to affect by our prayer before you, by our words, by our deeds? What can we do to bring peace to our planet? God, we need your grace to settle and redirect our hearts. We need your hope to rekindle and sustain our passion for justice. We need your wisdom that we might recognize anew your presence dwelling within us, calling us to live as people of light and hope rather than of darkness and fear. Be with us. Help us to truly believe not only in your abiding presence within, and among us, but in the power of our prayer to move mountains. Help us, O oh beloved, to build a world where people of every nation form community, where all coexist in peace, gratitude, and love. All this we ask in the name of you, our Creator, who creates peace in our hearts. Be still and aware of God's presence now as we listen to the familiar gospel from Jesus' appearance in the upper room. On the evening of that first day of the week, even though the disciples had locked the door where they were because of their fear, 
Jesus came and stood before them. Peace be with you, he said. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. At the sight of the Lord, the disciples rejoiced. Peace be with you, he said again. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you hold them bound, they are held bound. It happened that one of the twelve, Thomas, who was absent when Jesus came, the other disciples kept telling him, We've seen the Lord. And his answer was, I will never believe without probing the nail prints in his hands, without putting my finger in the nail marks and my hand into his side. A week later, the disciples were once more in the room. This time, Thomas was with them. Despite the locked doors, Jesus came and stood before them. Peace be with you, he said. And then to Thomas, take your finger, examine my hand, put your hand into my side. Do not persist in your unbelief, but believe. And Thomas said in response, my Lord and my God. Jesus then said to him, you became a believer because you saw me. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. It's appropriate that we, uh, we gather on uh, Mother's Day weekend, and thank you for making the time for coming on Mother's Day weekend. I know how it can be a busy time of travel and everything. And, um, but you know, the, the origins of Mother's Day uh, were actually from the uh, Civil War days, I think, with uh, Julia Ward Howard. I have it written here somewhere. Uh, uh, the origins of Mother's Day really celebrated the uh, mothers who were really trying to, who lost sons and, and daughters and, and family in the Civil War from the North and South, they were trying to come together to, to, to foster peace. Uh, so the, the origins of Mother's Day is really about focusing on how we can be a people of peace in a world that is often so wounded by war. I think it was Julia Ward Howe who wrote the Mother's Day Proclamation in 1870 to really promote world peace. Perhaps we've kind of lost that in the modern day, but what we're gonna do for these next few hours is really focus on how we, as people of faith, can be in solidarity and communion with all peoples of the world today, because people are gathering around the world at this time, at this hour, and at one o'clock, when we will walk the labyrinth, people around the world will be walking the labyrinth where they are with one intention, the intention of peace, for peace in our world, and especially today for peace in Ukraine. Uh, there was a essay in the New York Times a couple weeks ago uh, by photographer David Hume Kennerly, uh, in which he reflected on the photos uh, that, have been, that have been coming from the war in Ukraine. And, and you're gonna see on a loop here, several photos from the war from war in general, but several will be from the war in Ukraine. You've probably seen these. I don't know, I live in California, so I don't know what pictures have been in Kansas City, but uh, the most disturbing pictures, as you'll see, are from uh, Bukha, where the, the suburb of Kiev, where the Russian soldiers, perhaps frustrated by their inability to conquer the capital, at least really a, a horrific slaughter of people, and the photographs from of the dead bodies uh, laying in the streets of Bukha have, have really brought about cries from around the world, as you know, uh, to charge Russia with war crimes and genocide. Mr. Kennelly is someone who knows something about photographing war, documenting violence and death. He, uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize for pictures that he sent back from the war in Vietnam. And you'll see some of those pictures in this uh, blue. Uh, he was also the photographer on the scene uh, in, in Guyana in 1978. You remember the, the mass suicide uh, by the followers of Jim Jones, the mass murder and suicide. He was a, a, the first one there on the scene, one of the first photographers on the scene. 
And he said that the bodies of more than 900 people were strewn around this, this compound, a, a jungle clearing, victims and perpetrators of this mass murder and suicide. And he said it was like photographing a nightmare. His article in the Times, his essay in the New York Times was called Photographing Hell. And he writes, and, and the reason I bring this up is because before, at the very beginning of his article, and you'll know, and you also remember that before all the uh, news reports of the war in Ukraine, what's one of the first things they say? Some of this material is graphic, you know, it may not be suitable for everyone. And the bottom line for Mr. Kennebly's article was basically to say, I wish they would remove that disclaimer from television or from articles because we need to see, we need to look at what war does. We need to see these what these photographers have seen, the slaughter and the horror and the death caused by war. There's a photo in here, you've seen it probably already with the soldier in, from Vietnam, taken on Easter Sunday in 1971 weary from the war, head in hands, hovering uh, over the machine gun, and that crucifix hanging from his, from his neck, and the chain dangling, and the cross silhouetted, you know, against the sky. It's a powerful portrait. I, when I saw that picture again, uh, Dennis said it's a famous picture of the, of the war, of resurrection it's called, and it was a, a powerful portrait of how the cross can promote peace even as the war rages on. Uh, so the photographs that are emerging from this war in Ukraine, I think are important testimonies to the evil that war uh, imparts upon all of us. Early in the war, I remember the Associated Press reported from the Southwest city of Mariupol, which has been of course in the news the last several weeks because of all that's happened there. And uh, they reported that the bodies of children are dumped into this narrow trench, hastily dug into a frozen earth. Survivors bury the dead in mass graves as bombs continue to fall. We've heard reports of the bombings at maternity clinics and the hospital uh, and the, and the heart-wrenching stories that have come from the war. The pictures of uh, from Ukraine, especially from the AP, paint a portrait of unimaginable suffering and death. One of the most compelling uh, photographs was the family, this is from Buka here, the, uh, after the slaughter. One of the most compelling uh, photographs to me is this one. This was on the front pages of the New York Times, the family, the mother, and I want, to, I want to spend some time talking about this family. So maybe just, well, that's, that's right. Just take in that picture. Because this is the picture that appeared on the front page of the New York Times and on, page, on uh, pictures of uh, papers around the world. I want to tell you the story of that family. Uh, their names. To me, that was one of the most compelling and provocative and tragic pictures coming from the war. The 18-year-old son, the nine-year-old daughter, a young church worker who had already escaped with his family, coming back to help other people escape, uh, lying in the streets, their luggage strewn around them, killed by Russian soldiers. The weekend before that Russia invasion, invaded Ukraine, this is the 73rd day since the invasion happened. The mother, Tatiana, Tatiana Pirovenenis, the chief accountant for a tech company that's actually based in Silicon Valley, near where I live in California, attended a corporate retreat with other, uh, other uh, employees from her company. And one of her close friends told the San Francisco Chronicle that one day they went to the mountains where there was paragliding. And Tatiana, the mother, said to her friend, let's do it, let's paraglide, because she said she had no fear. 
She loved to fly. And she said, so they, they went. She said she was one who would, insisted, uh, insisted that we take risks. And what this friend said about her was this created a memory that she'll never forget. She was brave. She was free. She was enjoying her life. A week later, Tatiana, her son, Nikita, her daughter, Elise, and Anatoly Berezinti, who earlier had uh, escaped the bombing, as I said, with his family, but came back to help others escape, were killed by Russian bombs as they tried to seek shelter and safety, escaping their home. Satyana's husband, Sergei, was not with the family because he was in another part of Ukraine helping his mother to safety. According to reports, Satyana did not escape with her children earlier because her mother was sick and her son, Nikita, who was 18, had just started the university and was in the age group of males who were not allowed to leave because anyone 18 or older were conscripted to help defend Ukraine. My point here is that the world only knows Tatiana's name, Nikita's name, Elisa's name, Anatoly's name, because of this photograph from the New York Times and happened to be in an area not far from where they were hit and they, and they died and their luggage scattered near their bodies. According to the story, I mean, here were four people of many who tried to cross the bridge, whose deaths resonated far beyond the Ukrainian borders and that captured, that picture captures the indiscriminate slaughter by the invading Russian army that has increasingly, I think, uh, targeted civilian areas. So when he concluded his essay in the uh, Times, this is what David Hume Kennerly wrote. I'm getting tired of these endless disclaimers. The one at the top of this essay, he said, warning graphic materials. The best photographs of war might make us look away, but it's important that we do not. These pictures bear witness to the horrors of war, which is why printing a disclaimer, or which newspapers routinely do, really need to be removed. And though we are meant to protect, they're meant to protect people from seeing disturbing images, we need to be disturbed. <laughs> We need to be disturbed by the horrors of war because when we revert, avert our eyes, we fail to see the truth. Now imagine if I had begun the gospel story with uh, some may find the following material disturbing. <laughs> when Jesus appeared to the upper, in the upper room and showed his wounds that were visible on the body of Christ. It's not meant to shock us. It's meant to motivate us, motivate those, when Jesus appeared in the upper room, to motivate those who were fearful to bear witness to the horrors of evil that must be confronted and defeated by the power of good. If there had been a photographer that day in the upper room, that picture would have revealed Jesus showing his wounds, breathing upon his disciples, but showing his wounded, resurrected but wounded body to his disciples. He shows them the wounds and he breathes on them. And in those two sacred gestures, the eyes and hearts of his fearful friends are open to the presence of God. Jesus was not afraid to carry the wounds of the crucifixion on, in, on his body. He did not hide his scars. He did not hide his wounds. He wanted his followers to look. Don't avert your eyes. Look, don't turn away. Don't turn your head to the horrible suffering that exists in the world. Look at me, he says to his friends. And Thomas, of course, who was not present uh, at the first showing of Jesus' wounds, wanted proof of his suffering. He wanted document documentation. And that's what the photographs of the Ukrainian people suffering this genocide of the, really does. As Kennedy wrote, evocative images, showing images like this, affect people, spur action, and maybe even now and then alter the course of history. 
That's certainly what happened in that upper room. The course of history was changed by this provocative image of the risen but wounded Christ inviting Thomas, don't be unbelieving, come, take your hand, put it in my side. There's that wonderful painting by Caravaggio, you know, where, where it shows Jesus taking Thomas by the wrist and putting, him, putting the hand in his side, probing the wounds. Don't avert your eyes to the wounds that exist today in the world. Many renowned artists, of course, have captured those images in the upper room. The picture, again, is not just to confirm one's faith in the resurrection, as some would suggest, uh, because Thomas was uh, moved from doubt to faith. But I, even more important to me is the challenge to look, to probe, to stare down evil, to document crime and suffering and loss, so that when we rise up with Jesus, we confront the evil that's in the world from the power of good that is within us, from that light that dwells within us that started our day of prayer, believing that that power of light can overwhelm the darkness and that truth ultimately will overwhelm the power of evil. I've heard from so many people the last several weeks, why doesn't God hear our prayers for people of Ukraine? Why isn't God listening? What is the point of praying when there's so much suffering, so much evil in the world? And the question's really, it's an age-old question, isn't it? You know, Rabbi, Rabbi Harold Kushner addressed them, you know, say it several, many years ago in his famous book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, that if God exists, why is there suffering in the world? Why is there war? And he drew upon, of course, his own personal experience watching his beloved son Aaron die of, of a rare disease when he was only 14 years old. Rabbi Kushner wrestled, we've been wrestling with this question forever. And he wrestled with it from a very personal point of view. How could a good and kind and just God treat a child this way, his child this way? And most explanations of suffering, he said, serve more to excuse God rather than to explain suffering. One of the things he said that has always stayed with me is he said, God is as outraged by our misfortune as we are. Because God is indeed good and kind and just. But God allows suffering because God is leaving room for us to act, for human beings to act. Rather than remaining aloof or distant, above the fray, deaf to the cries of the poor, Blind to the pain of people, God chooses to respond, not with a wave of a divine hand or a magic wand, but with people. We know it from our ancestors in faith. He chose Moses, the fugitive, rising, raising up Moses to lead the people to liberation and, 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 and away from slavery and enslavement in Egypt to the, to, through the journey. He raised up Jesus, the beloved one, to again be that person to show the world the power of love can conquer the love of power. Today we've seen so many people around the world really rise up, nations rise up to help the people of Ukraine. Individuals, young and old, San Francisco and in the Bay Area, there have been probably as well here, and, you know, people left, people of Ukrainian descent left their homes, left their families, moved back to Ukraine to help in any way they could, to help, you know, resist the invasion. You know, they, they offered medical supplies, volunteers in different way, ways that they can. We've seen the, the tremendous courage of the Ukrainian president and the people. It's God's desire to always give us and the world a chance to make a difference for peace. God hears our cries. God hears and knows our suffering. God responds, maybe not in the way we prefer or in the time we would like, but God doesn't leave us alone to suffer. Doesn't leave us to suffer alone. He raises us up, and that's what we're doing here today in solidarity with one another, but also mindful that we're in solidarity with men and women and children around the world today who are gathering in places of prayer, much like this, around the world where there are labyrinths 
where people will take their time to be quiet and silent, to walk that labyrinth, come to the center, which is really what this day is about. It's about coming to that center, that light that dwells within us. That's what the physical act of walking the labyrinth does. It invites us to slowly take our time walking this labyrinth till we reach the center. And when we come to the center, we are with, coming to that place within us where light dwells, that wonderful namaste, where, where the good and holy dwells in each and every one of us. And when there, you, when we, each of us, live from that place within that is good and holy and peaceful and loving, and when the other lives from that place within himself or herself, their self, that they are good and peaceful and when we live from that place, there is no longer two of us. There is that one. There is that solidarity. There is that communion, that holy communion. That has the power, the power to make a difference in our world. I firmly believe this. You know, one of the most famous labyrinths in the United States is, that, is on, the, on, the, on the floor in the foyer of the Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. And as you know, I live in Berkeley, uh, and I sometimes take the, uh, the bar over and, and, and walk that labyrinth. The doors are open, I mean, and so many people from out there, the whole Bay Area, visitors, whatever, come to, come to walk that labyrinth as a place of prayer. When we built this reconciliation labyrinth in 2016, uh, it was in response to Pope Francis' year of mercy. Our charism as missionaries of the precious blood, missionaries and companions of the precious blood, is, is reconciliation in the world through the blood of Christ and renewal through the proclamation of the word. So that's why Precious Blood Renewal Center is a place of healing and hope, reconciliation and renewal. We seek this to be a place of transformation where people can come and encounter God in the depths of their hearts but also move out into the world to be people of peace, people of light amidst all the darkness. Walking the labyrinth is really a spiritual exercise that helps us find that sacred center, that safe place within, where we're in solidarity with every human being. Because when we enter that safe place, we recognize who we are as a child of God. And I trust our eyes are also open to see that other, the other, whoever the other may be, uh, is also a child of God. When you came in, you were given a reflection on, on nine ways of uh, waging peace. And uh, it comes from the work we've been doing in our reconciliation ministry. I was part of the, the team in Chicago when we established this Precious Bud Reconciliation Center of Reconciliation in 2002. This year is our 20th anniversary already. But the, and I've been taking that show on the road for the last 20 years or so, but it all comes down to us, and it, for me, it always comes down to recognizing that image of God and the person that we deem the enemy. But it must flow from that place within us that is good and holy and peaceful and loving. We must acknowledge that place. So, you know, part of what I'm trying to say today it's not only we acknowledge the evil that exists in the world, the horror, the pain, the death caused by war, but we confront that with the truth of who we are, the goodness that dwells within each of us, the goodness that dwells in our world, the goodness that dwells when we come together in solidarity. The, the labyrinth is really symbolic of life's journey. It's a, it, I believe it's a spiritual tool for our times. That's, so when I was in leadership, I really wanted us to have a labyrinth here in this renewal center because I believe that, it, it, and I would hope that all of you to take the opportunity to come out, I'm sure the staff here would more than welcome you to, to come out and walk that labyrinth whenever you need to, you know, find an escape, to find a quiet place to, to pray, to walk the labyrinth. This is an unusual labyrinth and it's a reconciliation labyrinth. It's patterned after the labyrinth in South Africa, designed for South Africa after the uh, uh, abolition of apartheid. 
You'll notice when we go out there, if you haven't walked this labyrinth before, it has two entries. The idea being uh, you come together, two people who are opposite or opposed in some way can walk the labyrinth and come to the center. And then there's a, another path, one single path in the middle coming out from the labyrinth is a bench, which is where, you know, ideally the two people who've been uh, opposed walk the labyrinth, pray, in the center and come and sit on the bench. Reconciliation. That's the hope. Today, of course, we'll each have the opportunity to walk the labyrinth on our own. And I would really encourage us, this is going to happen at, after lunch, after uh, one o'clock, at one o'clock, about quarter till we're going to begin. So we're just going to take our time. And again, we all can't walk the labyrinth at the same time. So, you know, just take your time when you get there and spend as much time as you need at the center. But I would encourage you, after everyone has had a chance to walk the labyrinth or be present, we'll do a clo our closing prayer up there at the labyrinth. We're, we're going to be finished by 2 o'clock, but that's the hope, that once everyone gathers there at the labyrinth and has the opportunity to walk the labyrinth in solidarity with peoples around the world, uh, Again, we can breathe in communion and solidarity with one another. I think the grace of this day, for me, is that we're not praying alone. And we're not only praying with one another. The grace of this day is that we're gathering and praying with solidarity with all peoples of the world. You know, I had the opportunity to, to do uh, retreats a few years ago with our missionaries in Poland who are, have opened up, they have four retreat houses in Poland. And the missionaries have opened up their houses now to uh, receive refugees from Ukraine. So they're really doing the work of, of this. The, the provincial over there, when I was provincial, he's now, I think, vice provincial. But he told me that the, uh, what we're reading in, in the news or seeing on television, it's just barely a glimpse of the horror that, of the stories that he's hearing of the people and the children that are coming through their, their mission houses. I, had emailed him early in the, the war to offer our prayers and solidarity. And um, he wrote a beautiful letter back that he said they're just, you know, we're not even capturing the depths of, of the pain and the agony and the, the horror that is going on. But when I went to Auschwitz, I was remembering one of the priests that uh, uh, took me to Auschwitz one day. And if you've been to Auschwitz or Dachau, you know the experience of just being in a place where an imaginable horror took place, you know, and, and I've spoken to this before here, but it's just, it was one of the most moving experiences and powerful experiences of my life because there were so many young people there that day. Many I learned from Israel because you cannot graduate from secondary school in Israel without first visiting Auschwitz, which to me is, again, a telling uh, reminder that you must face the horror, you must face the truth, you must understand and never forget. But then, you know, unlike uh, the only people wearing headphones that day were, were for translation, for the translation, because there's so many different people from different languages and countries and cultures there that they were, they were not listening to their music. At least I don't think they were. They were listening to the story and visiting these places. And visiting Auschwitz reminded me of something that Barbara Brown Taylor wrote in her book, When God is Silent, which is a book that I've revisited in the last few months because she addresses this question that I raised earlier. Why, why is there so much suffering? And what, what's the point of our prayer since it seems to make so little difference, you know, against it, to, to confront the evil and the suffering of the world? And so she, she tells the story in that book about uh, how several years ago, 150 Christians, Jews, and Buddhists, and Sufi Muslims from 10 different countries came together in November in the snow in the grounds of Auschwitz and Birkenau to remember the dead, to remember and to pray for those uh, who, were, who were killed in Auschwitz. And they met at these places of death, of evil, of 
of unspeakable horror, to make a retreat and to simply pray. And according to one on the retreat, every morning they walked an hour from Auschwitz, where they slept, to Birkenau, where they gathered on the railroad tracks. Birkenau was the, the place where the trains would come in from all over Europe to, to, to deliver the people to their deaths, basically, or to the working camps. And these 150 people formed a large ellipses around 75 yards long, and they sat in silent meditation twice a day, their breath curling up around their heads in the cold air. They simply breathed together, meditated together, twice a day, according to one of the participants, the purpose was to bear witness to what happened in that place, but also to listen, to listen for ways in which those events still echo in our lives today. What echoes do we hear today in our lives as we gather this morning, as we gather on this holy ground? What echoes of evil that are being carried in our day do we hear in the silence as we walk to the labyrinth and walk the labyrinth? And do we see and believe, truly believe, that our action today not only is a prayer of solidarity, but also a call to action, to resistance, to resist the evil that exists in the world? You know, I'm often reminded, I often pray the when I celebrate presiding the Eucharist, I often, uh, use the, the uh, Eucharistic prayer number three because it, it uh, well, one is I kind of know it by heart, at least the old version before the <laughs> new translation. <laughs> but there are, so there's, a, there's a couple wonderful phrases and like, you know, the people who've gathered, you've summoned here today. But there's that one line in there was, uh, may the prayer, that, uh, I will remember now, but the prayer, may our prayer here today affect the peace and salvation of all the world. And I wonder how many of us really hear that and believe that. That every time we gather around the table of Eucharist, our prayer that day around that table can affect the peace and salvation of all the world. How many of us even hear it to begin with? But how do we do we to believe it? Do we believe that our prayer today here at Precious Blood Renewal Center can affect the peace and salvation of the world? That's what this day is about. That's why I'm here. I believe that when people gather together across the miles, the countless miles around the world today, Praying together intentionally for peace, for justice, for that light. It can make a profound difference in our world. That's why we're here today, and that's what I believe. The church is cast, well, this is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. He said Dietrich Bonhoeffer, of course, he spent two years in Auschwitz and was executed there on April 9, 1945, for his resistance to Hitler and the Nazi, the Nazi regime, regime. And he said, he wrote, the church's task is not to simply bind the wounds of the victim beneath the wheel, but also to put a spoke in the wheel itself, to stop the wheel, the wheels of injustice, the wheels of war, to stop the wheel. He had accepted, you know, of course, if you read his letters and papers from prison, profound spiritual book, but he had accepted a post in New York in 1939, to, you know, because of the Nazi, uh, the Holocaust was beginning, or, you know, and, and he had accepted a post in Washington, which would have been, I mean, New York, to, 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 to be safe. But he went back to Germany, just like many today are going back to Ukraine to resist Hitler or to resist today Putin. Here was someone who understood that the message of the Paschal Mystery 
is to be lived, is to be lived in the world, to resist evil and learn to do good. The great late Desmond Tutu said, we're placed in the world as agents of transfiguration, to transfigure and transform the world, that we, each of us, agents of transfiguration. Remember the story of the transfiguration? Well, that image, that he's, even as Jesus was going to Jerusalem to experience the wounds of crucifixion and ultimately death, he was giving his disciples this moment of, 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 of glory, this moment of passion, this moment to say, remember this moment when you come together to pray and the light, dazzling light, bright, appearing before them. And of course Peter wanted to stay, the others wanted to pitch tents, but Jesus, no, we must go forth from here. And that's the, that's the movement of today. We gather to pray, we gather to enkindle the light, we gather to embrace the light that dwells within us, and then we move forward as agents of transfiguration in our world that is so filled with darkness, to believe that the power lies within each and every one of us, to confront the evil, to name the wounds, and to believe in the power of goodness over the power of evil. I pray that as we walk the labyrinth, we will be fully awake to the pain and suffering. And we'll do it intentionally. We'll do it quietly. But we'll do it intentionally. And the whole, especially the people of Ukraine, to embrace that call to be an agent of transformation, an agent of transfiguration in a world that is so often disfigured by war, which is being disfigured by war even now, as the pictures have shown us. And as we do, I invite you to hold in your hearts Tatiana, Nikita, Elise, Anatoly, all the victims of Ukraine, all the victims of violence in our world. I was watching the news last night that the, the gun violence in Kansas City, Westport. I mean, it's just, there's just so much violence, there's so much hate, there's so much anger, there's so much cruelty. It's enough for people to throw up their hands and say, what's the point? Well, the point is you're here. We're here today with our belief, our faith. Wounded though we are, believing the power of goodness and grace over evil. Believing deeply that each one of us holds that light within us and can be a beacon of hope in our world. And we also remember Sergei, who lost his family in that bombing on the streets of Kiev. And all the victims, many people who are grieving today the loss of loved ones because of violence. And may we believe deeply in our heart that as we pray for peace, that our prayer today may affect, through the grace of God, the peace and salvation of all the world. On the uh, handout that you received when you came in, there's just uh, nine ways for way to peace. And the, 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 uh, the idea of waging peace comes from a poem um, that I mistakenly call Mary Oliver. <laughs> Uh, but it was actually written by, uh, and I don't think her, <laughs> Judith, Judith Bright, I think her name is. She wrote it on, on September 11, 2011, of uh, 2001. She wrote it in the aftermath of the war, of the attack on the World Trade Center. And I want to conclude by reading that poem. I thought it was Mary Oliver. And it might have been based on a line that Mary Oliver wrote, I, um, which was about, which was on our handout, or uh, wage peace with your breath. That was the ticker line for the advertisement for this wage peace with your breath. This is what she wrote. Wage peace with your breath. Breathe in. Breathe in firemen and rubble. Breathe out. Breathe out whole buildings and flocks of red-winged blackbirds. 
Breathe in terrorists and breathe out sleeping children, freshly mown fields. Breathe in confusion, breathe out maple trees. Breathe in the fall and breathe out lifelong friendships intact. Wage peace with listening, hearing, hearing sirens. Pray loud. Remember your tools, flower seeds, clothespins. Clean rivers, make soup, play music, learn the word thank you in three languages, learn to knit, make a hat, think of chaos as dancing raspberries, imagine grief as the outbreath of beauty, or the gesture of a fish, swim for the other side. Wage peace. Never has the world seemed so fresh and precious. Have a cup of tea. Rejoice. Act as if the armistice has already arrived. Don't wait another minute. The poem suggests that we carry within us all those little things that we can do. That when you sit down with a friend, and have a cup of tea, you're waging peace. You're believing in the power of connection, the power of relationship, the power of love. It suggests that the simple things we do, making soup, taking it to the person who's shut in, is waging peace. So the nine uh, ways for waging peace that I put on this were inspired by uh, that poem, but they're simple. They're basically sent uh, and also developed through the years that we've been working on this reconciliation center. Again, it, there's no magic potion or magic cure. Waging peace is hard work. It takes commitment. But it all begins with stopping, breathing, detaching, and not being afraid to name the hurt, name the pain, name the anger. See, that's what too often times, like the first way there, too often times I think we're, we're too nice, <laughs> thinking, oh, you know, no, that didn't bother me. No, if, it, if you were hurt by someone, you have to name it. You can't, how many of us, because we're, you know, good people, we don't want to name the anger and the hurt. And all that unresolved anger simply stays with us. Breathe it out, let it go. But we need to be aware of it. We need to be aware of whatever it is, the resentment or the anger, and not allow it to consume us. As I say in this sheet, you know, with how many of us have given others an advice, the advice, you know, take a deep breath when we get some, you know, driving in California has made me practice this on a regular basis. <laughs> I'm sure driving here at times during rush hour is the same way, but out there it just seems like, you know. I recently I drove from uh, uh, the Bay Area, I was given a Hollywood retreat in LA, at a retreat center there, and it's just coming back on Easter Sunday. The glow of that retreat was dimmed rather quickly by, <laughs> by, the, by the mad, by, by the madness of the drive, of the drive. But I was trying, you know, the, the point here is to breathe, you know, and I don't often remember this because sometimes the anger can get the best of me. But, you know, again, these are not meant to, you've probably heard these many times before. And that third one is, that was on a poster by Coretta. What was his sister's name? Kent? Coretta? Corita Kent, yeah. That we had, that I remember in high school. To understand is to stand under, which is a good way to understand. You know, people have been waging peace with different quotes and anecdotes and stories for years and years and years. And it's just a matter of stopping, reminding ourselves that we have that power within us, in our families, in our relationships, that that's where peace begins with it, again, with each of us believing in that power of light over the, over the power of evil and the power of darkness. So we want, you know, you please take that with you and 
it's kind of based upon the uh, the, the, the nine or fruits of the spirit uh, the, from the quote from the Galatians there at the end of the, the day. Um, it's almost noon. I think that's the uh, time we're going to eat lunch. Um, and then uh, I was going to say any questions, but I think we'll have a conversation around the table during the meal. Is that all right? And then at 12.45, we'll begin our journey to the, uh, to the labyrinth. And I think it, Ron may have mentioned this, there's a golf cart for those who cannot walk, that there'll be uh, the golf cart will take you. Um, for those of us who can, we'll just begin. And I would invite us to, to make the journey quietly, silently, and not everybody get at the labyrinth, the, you know, all at the same time because we'll knock each other down. <laughs> but you know, to just take our time and walk and spend as much time as you'd like. Pray for one another as we do this. There's a lot of room around the labyrinth to stand and pray. So why don't we, before we uh, break bread together, why don't we ask God's blessing upon the meal? Loving God, we thank you for joining us around this table and the faces and the lives and the stories of those friends who gathered with us this day. We're mindful of the many graces and gifts that you give us each day, the many people you bring into our lives to reveal your, your divine face. We pray especially this weekend for our mothers, for all mothers. We pray for all those living and deceased, for the motherly ministry that they have provided for us, offering us hope and healing in our sometimes mortgage lives. May your blessing be upon us and upon them, on all those who are alone this day, who are without sufficient food or friendship. And we pray especially for all those who are giving us so much of their food and time and generosity for the people who are in need in Ukraine. We pray in solidarity through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for the men and women left behind fighting the unjust bombing, destruction, and loss of lives. For these we pray, O oh God, present among us, hear our prayer. We pray for the medical personnel caring for the injured, risking their own personal safety and well-being. We pray. O oh God, oh, present among God. us, hear our prayer. We pray for visionaries and peacemakers to rise up and grow in courage to challenge this unjust war. We pray, O oh, God, God, present among us, hear our prayer. We place our hopes for peace in our committed action against violence and injustice of any kind and commit ourselves once again to be your presence to our neighbor as we pray all peoples to live in peace, we pray. Oh God, 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 God,